Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we're going to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we'll do some data sufficiency problems. Data sufficiency problems that you will find on page number 208. At the end of the video, if you find this thing helpful and if you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for, to get you prepared for the G GMAT, you can get hold of me at Keshwani Prep at iCloud.com. Just send me an email and we'll see what we can do. Page 208, beginning with number 296. Let's take a look at it. Number 296 actually is a very straightforward problem, very simple problem. In fact, actually very silly problem. Question is how much is Z? In the first in the first statement they tell us that X is equal to 50. And what they give us is a triangle. This is Z, this is X, and this is Y. As you can clearly see, that simply knowing X is, does not enable us to know what Z is, we also need to know Y. We don't know Y at this point. The first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. The first statement by itself is not enough. Answer cannot be A or D. The second statement tells us that Y is 35. Again, second statement by itself is not enough. Simply knowing Y does not enable us to figure out what Z is unless we know what X is. So answer is not B. But of course, when we put them together, if we know X and Y, we can figure out this missing angle, which is simply 180, which is simply 180 minus X and Y. And once we know that, we can figure out the Z. The answer is C. The answer is C. Putting the two statements together will do the job. Number 297. Sometimes you wonder why they even bother with something so silly as that. Number 297, we have an investment. That earns 4% compounded annually. The question simply is, what is the difference? Or better yet, I'm going to read it verbatim from the book. What it says, it says, the interest earned for the third year, interest earned for the third year, which I'm describing here as Y subscript 3, is how much greater than the amount of interest that you earn in the first year. Interest year is how much interest earned in third year is how much greater than the interest earned in the first year. It's simply saying, what's the difference between these two interest interest that you earn in the third year and the interest that you earn in the first year. Let's see what the first statement tells us. It says, at the beginning of the second year, at the beginning of the second year, account had $4,160. There you go. Account had $4,160. And this amount that we have at the beginning of the second year, let's use, let's use the symbol P subscript 2 to represent that P for the principal, the amount that we start out with, P1 would be the amount that we actually started out with in the very beginning, in the beginning of the first year. At the end of, at the, end of the first year, which is the same as the beginning of the second year, we have this much amount. And we know we are earning 4%. Well, if you are earning 4%, then the amount that we learn on the account, which is P2, which is what we are calling here, has to equal to the amount that we started out with, which is the principal at the beginning of the first year, plus 4% of it, plus the 4% of it, which of course is same as, if you take the P1 common, you get, I'm um, explaining way too much. There you go, this is our equation. And the point here is that, once we know that thing, of course we can figure out the principle that we started out with, which is simply the amount that we have at the, at the end of the second year, divided by 1.04, and we know how much we have at the end of at the, at the end of second years, which is 4,160 divided by 1.04. We can figure out the amount that we started out with. And once we have that, 
Of course, we can figure out how much interest we earn in any given year, how much interest we earn in the first year, how much interest we earn in the second year, third year, and so on and so forth. And we can figure out the difference between the two. We can figure out how much, how much more interest we earn in the third year compared to the first year. The first statement by itself is enough. We are not going to do the work. We shouldn't do the work. If we try to do the work, you will find that it will take too much time, way too much time. Uh, if you like, we can do it at the end of the video, but not right now. So, first statement by itself, A, D, B, C, E. First statement by itself is enough. First statement does the job, which means we know answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that at the beginning of the third year, at the beginning of the third year, account had $4,326. Well, there you go. Same exact idea. I'm going to erase this part because it's getting too crowded. Again, without doing any math, because if you start doing this thing, it gets to be too much. Beginning of the third year, which is the P subscript 3, the amount that you would have is the amount that we started out with, the principal that we started out the first year. And since we're talking about beginning of the third year, it's this much amount. This is the amount here. This is 4326, we are told. It's equal to 1.04 squared, because it's compounded. It's just, the interest is compounded, so it's not 4% for the first year, it's not 4% of the P1, and then again 4% of P, P1 again in the second year. It's not like that. In the second year, we're going to earn more because the m amount will have grown by 4%. And it's this amount. There we go. Again, the same thing. P1 is simply 4,326, which is this guy right here, divided by 1.04 squared, and we can figure out how much amount that we started out with. And once we know that, once we know the principal amount that we started out with, as we said before, we can figure out the amount of interest earned for any year. And of course, that then we can figure out the difference between how much we earn in the third year compared to what we earn in the first year. Which means second statement by itself is also enough. The answer is D. As I keep repeating, you mustn't, you mustn't try to do it out. That is not the point here. That will take forever. Sometimes we do it out, like a little while ago. Uh, sometimes we do it out if it's too simple. It is way too simple. Here, in number 298, the question is how much is circumference? How much is circumference? And the first part tells us that the radius is equal to 2 pi. And here, we will quote unquote do it out because it's very simple. Circumference, as we know, is 2 pi r and r, 2 pi r, and we are here told, there you go, 2 pi, the radius is 2 pi. We didn't have to do it out, but here we go, that's, that's your circumference. It's just 4 pi squared. First statement by itself is enough. First statement by itself is quite enough. A, D, B, C, E, which means the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D depending on what we are told in statement, second statement. Second statement tells us that the center of the circle is 7, 8. Simply knowing the center of the circle, if you know the center of a circle, there is no way in hell we can figure out what the circumference is. It has nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with the radius unless we know some coordinates of the outermost uh, one point on the circle itself, then we can figure out the radius. It doesn't tell us that. Second statement by itself is not enough. Simply knowing the circle Simply knowing the center will not enable us to figure out the radius. And unless we know the radius, we cannot figure out the circumference. Because the radius, as you know, is 2 pi r. Second statement by itself is not enough, therefore the answer is A. 299. 299. 299 asks us how much is t? How much is t? First statement tells us that s plus t is equal to 6 plus s. This is just too damn silly. It's just too silly. 
Of course, as this will drop out, T equals 6. First statement by itself is enough. First statement by itself is enough. Answer would have to be either A or D. We cross out B, C, and E. Second statement tells us that T cube is equal to 216. There you go. If T cube is equal to 216, even if you do not know, even if you do not know what the cube root of 216 is, it doesn't matter. Whatever the cube root of 216 is, of course we can figure out T equals the cube root of 16, which happens to be 6. Second statement by itself is also enough. The answer is D. Answer is D. Because if you know the cube root of a number, of course you can figure out, you can take the, if you know the cube of a number, you can take a cube root of it, and that's it. 300. Sometimes it makes you wonder what goes through these people's mind when they start giving silly things like that. Number 300. In number 300 we are told that the total cost of a repair, you took the car to a mechanic and the total cost of repair is labor plus parts plus 6% sales tax on labor and parts. You have to pay the sales tax not just on the parts but on the parts as well as labor. We are further told, we are further told that the parts are $50. They go on to tell us that the parts are fifty dollars. I just want to make sure that I didn't misread it. It says if the charge for parts, excluding the sales tax, so this is fifty dollars. It's just for the part. It doesn't include the sales tax. Was fifty dollars. The question is, what was the total charge for the repair? So we're looking for the total charge for the repair. Let's call it. Let's just call it total cost. Okay. The first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that the sales. Sales tax, sales tax on labor was 960. Well, there you go. We already know how much we paid for the parts. If, if we already know how, how we are told, we are told that the parts were fifty dollars. If we can somehow figure out how much we pay for the labor, we can figure out the total cost because all we have to do is add six percent, six percent to six percent of this amount and that amount, and we will figure out the total cost. What we need here is the labor, and they tell us here. They tell us. That the sales tax on labor was nine dollars and sixty cents, and we know, we know that nine dollars and sixty six, nine dollars and sixty cent must represent six percent, six percent of the cost. So six percent of the labor. We can figure out the labor from there. Labor is simply nine sixty divided by 0 0.06, and that's it. Multiply top and bottom by multiply top and bottom by 100, and you'll end up with 960 over 6. Again, we don't have to do this thing. We simply have to real. We didn't even have to write out this part. We simply have to realize from this equation that we can figure out the labor. Once we know the labor, once we can figure out the amount of labor, we already know the amount of parts. We just have to add six percent of these two amounts, and we know the total cost. The first thing by itself is quite sufficient. A D B C E. The first statement by itself is quite sufficient. The answer cannot be B C or E. Answer would have to be here, either A or D. Let's finish this up since I started it. In the exam, we will not do that. You understand? How many how many six does nine have? Nine has one six. After we take away six from the nine, we have a remainder of three. What happens to the three? Three goes and joins the six and becomes thirty-six. And thirty-six has six sixes. And how many six does zero have? Zero has no sixes. So the answer is the labor was one hundred sixty dollars. The labor was one hundred sixty dollars. Parts were fifty dollars, so it's two hundred and ten dollars plus six percent of $210. The total cost, we didn't actually have to figure it out. It's data sufficiency, not data calculation. Uh, it, it is called data sufficiency. We simply have to establish that we have sufficient data, and we do. Second part. Second statement tells us, oh, second statement is just as easy. It says the total, total sales tax Total sales tax is twelve sixty. There you go. Total sales tax is twelve sixty. Let's let's call let's call this part labor and parts. This part alone. And this part alone, we just gonna call it T for the total parts and labor, not including tax. You understand? Which means that zero point six percent of T. Which, which is 
here here t equals labor and parts not it doesn't include taxes which is why i did not use a t here so 6% of the total total cost which is parts and labor must equal 1260 but there you go from there we can figure out the total total would have to be 1260 divided by 0 0.06 and again we don't have to do it out we simply have to realize we can figure out the total cost once we know the total cost we simply take 6% of that add that to total cost and we'll have the total amount I'm using total cost in a very confusing way uh, total of parts and labor I should say once we know the total of parts and labor we can add 6% to it and we'll have the amount that we paid do you understand why don't we call this total bill total bill that way we avoid this confusion because I kept using the cost for labor and parts. Total bill is, is the amount that we'll have to, to write the check out for what we'll have to pay. That's it. The answer is D. Second statement by itself is also enough. Since we started out with, let's do that. Let's, let's multiply top and bottom by, let's multiply top and bottom by, by 100. If you multiply top and bottom by 100, what we end up is 1260 over 60. And as you can see, it's very straightforward. 6, 12 has 12 has two sixes and six has one sixes and zero has no sixes. Two hundred and ten dollars is exactly what we found a little while ago. We found that the parts and labor were two hundred and ten dollars, and that's all there is. That's all. Answer is D. Three hundred and one. Three hundred and one. Oh, it's the last one on the page. 301 is the last one on the page. And that's all there is. Three hundred and one says that we have a total of B books. B number of books. We are further told that 25 of those are hardcover fiction. Hardcover fiction. The question is, how many books do we have? The first statement tells us that we have 40 fiction books, and the rest are rest are non-fiction. We know that we have 40 fiction books, and the rest are non-fiction. We are told that we have 25 books that are hardcover fiction. What the first statement tells us, all we can get out of the first statement is that we have more than 40 books. We do not know how many books we have altogether. There is no way to figure out how many books we have altogether. It may be as many as 41. It may be as few as 41. Or it could be as many as 41 million. Who knows? The first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. The first statement by itself is not enough. That tells us that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that there are there are 60, 60 hardcovers. And the rest are the rest are paperback. Let's use P for paperback, let's use H for hardcover, and let's use F for fiction. Books that are fiction, not hardcover fiction, but the books that are fiction. Let's not put it there right now. Again, simply knowing that there are 60 hardcover books and the rest are paperback does not enable us to figure out how many total books we have. All this tells us is that we have more than 60 books, maybe as few as 61, or again 61 million. But if we put them together, Perhaps we can get someplace, but second statement by itself is not enough. But perhaps if we put them together, maybe we can get someplace. Let's, let's do it on the top here. I need the room. I'm going to have to erase this thing and, and put it here. There are a couple of ways, there are a couple of different ways we can do that. We can set it up uh, in the form of a Venn diagram, or we can set it up in, in the form of a table. Let's do it table. I think this table is simpler. This very table is simpler to look at. So here we have hardcover, here we have paperback, and here we can have a total number of books. Here we have fiction, and here we have nine fiction, and again here we have total. 
The first gentleman told us that we have 40 fiction books and the rest are non-fiction. This is fiction right here, so we have 40 fiction books. This comes from the statement one. The second statement tells us we have 60 hardcover books. Here is hardcover and we have 60 of those. This comes from the second statement. And in the, in the problem itself we are told, in the problem itself we are told that we have 25 hardcover fiction. 25 hardcover fiction right here. This comes from the problem itself, so I'm going to put a circle next to it. Do you understand? Now, what can we gather from it? Let's begin then. We're going to change the, I'm going to change the color so we can see it. All we can gather from this, all we can get out from this is that if we have 40 hard, if we have 25 hardcover and 40 total total number total number of books that are hardcovers is 40, we are told, and 20, uh, sorry, we have we have 40 fiction books altogether, 40 fiction books, and we are told that we have 25 hardcover fiction. If we have 25, these are fiction hardcovers, 25, then all we can gather from that is that we must have 15 paperback that are fiction. But we are still missing these three things. Actually, we can get that out too. We can get that out too. If we have 60 altogether hardcover books and we have 25, there are 60 altogether, 60 fiction books and 25 of those are hardcovers, then we must have 35, we must have 35 non-fiction books that are hardcover. But what about these three boxes right here? This is, this is what we need to figure out. This is what we're trying to figure out here. We need to know, we, we are, there are three pieces of information that are missing. And out of, the, out of those three, we have to know at least one. If we can figure out either this, this or that, we can figure out the rest of the boxes. We, we, let's, let's number them so we can talk about them. Uh, here's number one. Number one is the total non-fiction. Total non-fiction. If we can figure out the total non-fiction, if somebody gives us the information of how many non-fiction books we have total, once we have that, we can figure out how many, how many of them are paperback from, from here. Whatever this amount is, minus 35. And once we know that, we know that, we can figure out that part. And once we know this, we figure out total. Or, or, this is rule number two, which is this box right here, which is the total paperback. Total. If we, if we know the total paperback, we can, we can solve the problem. Or, of course, the third part, which is right here, which is paperback, paperback nonfiction. How many paperback books we have that are non-fiction? We have to know, the point here is that there are three pieces of information that are missing. We can figure out two of those three pieces if we know the third one. But until we know that one piece doesn't, uh, well, either one, two or three, either one or two or three, we have to know one of those three. Until we know that, we cannot, we cannot answer the question how many books we have. The answer is E. Even putting the two estimates together, together does not get us anywhere. That was the end of that column. I'm not going to start the second column right now. I think it's pretty long already. I think I spent way too much time on this problem. I was going too slowly, I, 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 I believe. But anyway, it's done. So I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll do some multiple choice problems from where we left off yesterday. And we'll continue with our journey. If you'd like to get hold of me, as I told you in the beginning of the video, you can reach me at Keshwani Prep, that's P-R-E-P, Keshwani Prep at iCloud.com. Send me an email and I'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. Alright? Bye now.